thank you so much for joining us for the webinar for making a plan for the varroa mite. My name is Megan Milbrath, and I work in honeybee extension and research at Michigan State University. I'll be your host tonight. Becky Masterman from the University of Minnesota Bee Lab is co-hosting, and she'll cover the chat and help with technical issues if you're having any, and she'll also manage the questions. Um, so you'll notice in your bar you'll have a Q&A section, and you should be able to use that if you have questions at any time. I'm going to go through a short presentation, and then um, I'll be able to stop during the time and answer questions as long as they're varroa related, and I'll leave time for some questions at the end as well. This webinar is a part of the Mite Check program, which was funded through a USDA NEFA grant, and it's a collaboration through a couple different universities and the Be Informed Partnership. Um, we use, a, I'm going to reference a lot the Mite Check page. So if you haven't already reported things, um, make sure that you use that to report. You can find it at mitecheck.com. Uh, the recording will be linked to at our website, keepbeesalive.org. Um, there's also some Varroa resources there. There's also going to be some handouts very shortly. They're not up today because we're in the middle of bee season, and I was out in the bee yard all day, but they will be up there shortly. So you'll be able to watch this again. There'll also be a handout um, because I'm going to cover a lot of information, and I know that you'll want to be able to access it later. This is the third video in the series. Um, We've got the rest of them on our YouTube channel for Michigan State University beekeeping, or you can find them on the Keep Bees Alive. In the first one, which is called Why Did My Bees Die, we discussed how you can diagnose a colony that has died from varroa-associated viruses. In the second video, I covered the biology of varroa mite and the natural dynamics, and also went into how we monitor for varroa. I'm going to review a bit of that tonight because it's relevant to this third session. Um, but in this third session, I really am going to discuss the tools that we have to manage the pest. All right, on with the show. All right, so I'm creating this video as a way to help both bees and beekeepers. Um, as I mentioned in my other resources, I get a lot of calls from people who are really struggling with Varroa. And it's 2018, and people are really having trouble keeping their bees alive. In extension, one of the classic relationships that we see is we've got beekeepers who are really excited about keeping bees. They're really enthusiastic. They're very well-meaning. They're trying really hard. They're reading lots of books, going to classes, and then they lose 50, 100% of their bees their first year. And then they chalk it up to, well, I'm a beginner, so then they try it again. And then their second year, they lose 50 to 100% of their bees. And then maybe they try it again, and maybe they actually start doing a little more treatment or starting to pay attention to Varroa. And a lot of times the third year, they're still struggling, or even longer. And then usually by a couple years of this, it gets way too expensive. It's not fun anymore. And we see people take a one of two paths. Either they quit, taking, quit beekeeping, or they really start to take Varroa seriously. If you're having really high losses, managing this pest is one of the best things that you can do. So my goal tonight is to help beekeepers break out of this cycle, or if you haven't entered it, which is even better, um, to help you so that you can just have healthy bees that are staying alive. So my personal teaching philosophy is that honeybees are animals. And as animals, they are worthy of care and respect. It's not in line with my personal values to let animals die from treatable illnesses. However, it also makes me really sad to see how polarized beekeepers have become over this issue. So personally, I don't care how you keep your bees healthy as long as they are healthy. If the animals under your care are kept in good health, then you're doing a great job, in my opinion. In this video, I am not going to give you the right way to keep your bees safe from Varroa. Instead, I'm going to give you more options and more information on the tools that we have. This way, you can put together your own management strategy to make sure that your bees are healthy and safe from parasites. All right, so we are in an epidemic right now of Varroa transmitted viruses, and it is one of the most challenging parts of beekeeping if not the most challenging part right now. These parasites are known to enter almost every single colony in the United States, every single beekeeping season, all over the country. But this isn't the first epidemic that we've had, and we can kind of use tools for other epidemics to understand how we deal with it. So this is the tracheal mite, which is a horrible pest of honeybees, and almost a few decades ago, it almost wiped out honeybees in a couple places. 
And this mite here, hopefully none of you have ever seen. Um, it's called the Tropolalops, and it isn't in the U.S., but we're constantly monitoring for it because it's a really horrible pest of honeybees. It's faster than Varroa and is probably going to be worse. And I'm not going to talk about these much more except just to bring up that part of keeping bees healthy in this era of global pests is focusing so much more on whether or not you treat it. We really do have to get in the habit of knowing that there are these threats that come in from the environment and there's a variety of different parasites that our bees are at risk for and we have to constantly be paying attention to parasite loads um, of our honeybee colonies. And when we first started to get varroa in the United States about 30 years ago, so it came in in the mid 80s, and beekeepers weren't really too worried at first. And the reason is because we had miticides and we thought that it could be easily controlled. So you put in a pesticide, it kills the mites, we don't have a problem. But then two things started to happen. First, the mites started to develop resistance to the miticides. They were no longer effective in controlling the mites. Second, we started to learn a lot more about pesticides and how they build up in the wax and how they can have negative effects on bees and stay in hives for a really long time. And a lot of beekeepers didn't want to use them. Um, this is a figure from scientificbeekeeping.com, which I'll reference a couple times. And it's a really good site for varroa dynamics. And what it shows is that when um, varroa mites first came in, beekeepers started to use fluvalinate. And it seemed to be working fine, and then the mites quickly became resistant. So then a lot of beekeepers switched to Kumafos, but then the mites quickly became resistant. Amitraz, which is the third synthetic chemical, does still seem to be effective against the mites, but its use is incredibly widespread in the beekeeping industry, so we really don't know how much longer that we have it. And we don't have um, a lot of other things in the pipeline. All right, so. Our goal is that we want to keep our bees healthy. That's our number one goal. We also want to do a couple of things. We want to do it by minimizing or eliminating, eliminating in-hive pesticides while we can. But we want to make sure that in the forefront is we're never allowing our colonies to be overrun with mites. Um, so we especially want to make sure that we're not dumping things in the colony unnecessarily, especially things that build up in the wax. And so we're trying to strike this balance of keeping our girls in good health um, but not using unnecessarily things. So the way that we work with epidemics is by controlling the spread of disease while working on permanent resistance. And anyone that has heard me speak before knows that I'm passionate about beating, breeding better bees, so I'm not going to promote that we're doing things that get work be weak bees. And a lot of people think that if we um, treat bees for varroa, then we're making them weaker. And in reality, we've got two things that have to happen for us to get out of this epidemic. So one of them is that as beekeepers, we're doing things called that allow us to do epidemic mitigation, meaning we're stopping disease transmission. And that's a short-term thing. And then in the background, there are breeders and there are researchers who are doing strategies that the bees use to reduce feral mites. And this is breeding, and this is genetic advancement, and this is the long-term strategy. There's never a case where we have another animal and that gets an epidemic, and the way that we beat it is just by letting a bunch of animals die. Breeding for resistance is actually a lot of work, and that requires a lot of effort and a lot of planning. So as beekeepers, we're going to do these management strategies. So this is what I'm gonna talk about. And the reason that I'm bringing this up right now is because a lot of beekeepers are hearing the message that it's okay to let bee bees die. And I just wanna acknowledge that that messaging is out there and I know that it is, but I totally disagree with it as a strategy. And it's not just because I'm this treatment loving industry shill, it's because I, and I have other materials that talk about this, but really what we have to do is we have to get this epidemic under control. We have to get these viruses to stop um, taking over so many bees. And then we have to also at the same time be doing breeding separately. So I have a couple other things that are related to that, um, that I'll, and I'll make those handouts available if people wanna discuss that more. But in the short term, we're looking at epidemic control. And unfortunately, there's not a silver bullet for dealing with this pest. If there was, then I could be out having a barbecue tonight rather than in my office discussing mite control options with you for the next hour. So like all things in beekeeping, the management that you have to do for your colony is going to depend on what's going on in your hive, what time of year it is, what, and especially what is the risk in your area. 
All right, so we need to develop a plan that helps us keep our mites safe, or our bees safe, safe from mites all year long. We need to know a few things. First, we need to know that the level of mites in your colony. We need to know if our bees are safe at that level. And then we need to know the tools that we have to keep the mite populations at a safe level. And I covered, so the first one, knowing the level of mites in your colonies, I covered the monitoring techniques in the video, Understanding Varroa Risk, and I'm going to refer to them here. So you can watch that video if you need a reminder on monitoring, but it's really important to understand these dynamics. All right, so basically we want to know if we're in the safe zone with mites or if we're in this area to the right where the population has taken off and our bees are in danger. So with Varroa, we get exponential growth, meaning that there's a period through the summer where there's mites in our colonies, but then all of a sudden the mite population will take off and that's when we start to get a lot of viruses and we start to have a lot of sick bees. And it completely overwhelms the hive and this happens at the time when our winter bees are getting made. So our job as beekeepers is to make sure that that colony of mites never takes off so that our bees are not overwhelmed by this population. So if we can stay at a low level all year round, especially in that time when our winter bees are made, then we're going to be safe. We're also going to discuss a few tools that we have in our back pocket in case we actually get to the point where the mite levels take off. All right, so we're gonna cover the tools that we have available and I'm gonna split them into those two groups. So first we have tools that break rep varroa reproduction. And these are things that keep a low mite population from taking off in the first place. And then secondly, we have tools to use if the infestation is really high already. And those are ones that bring the mite population down. With Varroa, we use monitoring to let us know if we need to take immediate action. We also use monitoring to predict if we are expected to remain under control before winter. And so remember that with this exponential growth, the population can peak and it can happen really fast. And what sometimes happens is that beekeepers fixate on this threshold and they don't do anything until the pests are way over that threshold. And when this happens, the bees are often sick with viruses by the time the beekeeper intervenes to manage the mites. Since it takes weeks for most treatments to work, your bees may be sick for a long time and they, not, they maybe don't recover quickly enough to pull it together before winter. For example, if I see 3% infestation in my mites like right now in June, that maybe is below a recommended treatment threshold and so my bees aren't in immediate danger and I'm probably not seeing um, signs of the virus or disease. However, at this level, if I was at 3% in early June, the mite population would for sure be out of control by winter. So if I don't take action now, I'll be dealing with sick bees later. Similarly, if I see 1% infestation in June, it doesn't mean that I'm okay for the rest of the year. It's not that, oh, I checked, my bees are fine, and now they're fine for the rest of the summer. It is um, just because it's low now. So try to view monitoring as just that. You're keeping track of the parasite load in your hive. It's also important that we use our models too. So we use our notes from previous years to help guide our decisions. If we've lost our bees, for example, for two years in a row to Varroa, then we already know that we're living in a high risk area. So this is really good data that can help us plan ahead so that we don't hit another population peak for another year. All right, so first I'm gonna talk about ways we control Varroa populations before, so to make sure that we don't hit a peak before winter. This is the area in the peak, so I'm gonna talk about this gray area. Your bees may help with this, but you can't assume that your bees will take care of Varroa themselves yet. Um, this is where the breeding becomes really important. We're looking to find bees that can handle small amounts of mites and can keep them from taking off, but most bees can't take care of Varroa by themselves yet and most bees can't recover when the viruses take hold. So even if we have ones that are bred really well, they often can't come back if a huge amount of mites are in the colony. For the rest of the talk, I'm gonna go through each option. I'm gonna talk specifically about where it fits best into a management strategy. And keep in mind, you're gonna hear a lot of my opinion on these, so it's important that you're just trying things out for yourself as well. All right, so I'm just gonna go through all of our tools one by one. The first is screen bottom boards. So here's a picture of a screen bottom board. The idea behind it is that the bees will groom the mites off, the mites will fall to the ground, and they'll be removed from the hive. The pros are that 
it's really simple to employ. You just put it on the hive and that is it. The downside is that it really doesn't move, remove that many mites. Um, it's when it first came out, people got really excited about screen bottom boards. I switched to a ton of different screen bottom boards and you do see mites fall through. Um, anyone who uses an inspection board can see that, but it does make the colony, um, it doesn't do enough. So you can't just put a screen bottom board on and count that being sufficient. It also does have a couple smaller things. It does make the colony cooler. We often see that the cluster moves up a little higher. And it does limit your mite treatment options if you're looking at some of the acids that require fumigation. Um, how to use it, you put it under the bottom of a hive and you leave it open during peak season. You can note on this photo that this stand is really high off the ground, so it's not gonna work if you put it on a screen bottom board and then put it on a solid bottom board. The whole point is that the mites fall um, a long ways to the ground and they can't get back into the hive. It works the best in warm weather and when you've got really big colonies, and also when you're combining it with other strategies. And you have to leave it open so it falls to the ground. So in my experience, I got a bunch of them, I got really excited about them, I still have a bunch of them out in the field, but I'm switching back to solid bottom boards. And the reason I'm switching back to solid bottom boards mainly is that I kept breaking the screen bottom boards in my truck, and they took a lot longer to make. Um, and so, it's not because I actively dislike them or I think that the bees did much worse on them. So if you've got a screen bottom board, great. Just don't think that it's going to take care of everything. If you don't have screen bottom boards, um, you're also perfectly fine and your bees will be fine. It's not necessary. So they're also good to check if your treatments work. So let's say you put in a mite away quick strip and you've kind of had it for a while or maybe you stored it in your truck for too long and it got a little weird and it might not work. And one of the things I'm gonna stress is you don't, just because you put in a treatment does not mean that you controlled mites. We're really gonna talk about controlling the population of parasites. We're not gonna talk about whether or not you treated or didn't treat. I just wanna know that your mites are under control. So if you put a treatment in and you don't see mites falling to the bottom, that might be that you got a bad batch or that it wasn't handled properly or that you didn't apply it properly. I'm not talking about using screen bottom boards as a way to monitoring for mites. Again, if you watch the second video, that talks a lot about monitoring. Um, we really advocate for the ones that allow you to have a percentage of infestation, which is the alcohol wash and the sugar roll. So that's how I feel on screen bottom boards. Moving on to drone brood removal. So we use the fact that most of the varroa are under the cappings to our advantage and we could use the drone cells like a trap. So once the mites are in the capped drone pupa cells, we just remove them from the hive. So the pros of this is you actually are physically removing a lot of mites from the colony. The downside is that it takes a lot of energy for a colony to raise a full frame of drones. And this energy could be used to raise honey, um, draw wax, bring in, or raise young, draw wax, bring in honey. And I've done this move before too. If you forget to remove the drone frame in time, you've just provided a lovely place for more mite reproduction. Another downside is that it can only be used when the colony is naturally drawing wax and raising drones. And so this means that it's not gonna work in the fall. Like in September, you're not gonna get bees to draw it out. It's also not going to work on really small colonies. So this is really an option for your big colonies. You can do it by purchasing these green drone frames um, for drone brood, and you put it on the outer edge of the brood nest. So if you've got you know, honey on the outside, then pollen, you'd put a drone frame there, and then you've got your brood in the middle. There are people who just do it once a season, like they put it in right at the beginning. Once it's filled with drones, they take it out and replace it with a regular frame. There's people who do it many times a season. Um, there's people who do two frames per hive. There's people who do one frame per hive. Um, the other one that I like to do is this lower photo, and you can see they've just put a medium frame into a deep brood box. And you could do something similar if you only have mediums by just putting a foundationless frame in with a bunch of frames that have foundation. If you're going all foundationless, then for sure you're gonna be able to find some drone comb anyway. And in this case, you would just take your hive tool and scrape it off, and I usually feed it to my chickens who go crazy for it, but you could just throw it away or put it in your freezer and put um, it back in. 
So like I said, it works best only on strong, healthy colonies that are already interested in raising drones. And also when you can logistically do it on a schedule. So you have to visit each colony multiple times. And especially when you're getting that wax drawn out, you know, you can stick that green frame in there and come back on a day that you think they're capped and maybe they haven't even drawn it out yet. And they're not going to draw it out when there's not sufficient nectar. So you can't just put it in in the last minute or you can't put it in during a drought. There's other fancy versions of this. Um, this is the mite capper where it actually just heats the thing. So the idea or the mite zapper and the idea is you put this frame in, they draw out the drones on it and then you can hook it up to a battery and heat them. Um, it does work. It's great if you like toys. There are some downsides where it doesn't work too. So sometimes you put it in and they decide not to put drone brood in it and they decide just to fill it in with honey. Um, I do know people that use it pretty regularly and it is an effective way to keep track of mites. So if you're someone that is good about being on a schedule and you've got enough hives that you can manage it and they're big, this is a totally good one. Um, there's a question about just scrape being capped drone cells from the bottom of regular frames, and that's fine too. Um, I usually just take a drone, um, like a drawn comb bucket or a burr comb bucket out to the yard, and I'll just scrape extra drone brood into that. So if you find it, you could just remove it. Um, and again, if you're just doing something small like that, just count that you're pulling some mites out of the hive, but there's going to still be a lot underneath the cappings of the worker brood as well. All right, breaks in the brood cycle. So this is one of my favorite. And basically the varroa only reproduce when there's capped brood. So if you don't have capped brood, you don't have varroa reproduction. And so for breaking the brood cycle, there's basically a time where the varroa can't reproduce. And remember, we're not trying to get all the varroa out of our hive forever. I mean, we kind of are, but that's not, we don't have that option with any of our tools. So what we're looking to do is to make sure we don't get that huge peak in the population before winter time. And so if we can break the brood cycle, we can basically stay ahead of varroa. There are definitely people who do almost the entirety of their varroa control using breaks in the brood cycle. And honestly, for a lot of beginner beekeepers who have bees living through the winter, their bees are doing this a lot of times because sometimes as beginners, we make mistakes that actually result in less varroa. So for example, um, by allowing the bees to get way, way super crowded and we fill in the brood nest with honey and the bees swarm, we actually can induce a two week break in the brood cycle, which is great for keeping varroa down. And you'll say, oh, I didn't do any treatments and my bees still live, when in reality, you actually did a very good job of a treatment. But there's much more elegant ways to do that where you actually hang on to your bees. So the pro is that it completely stops varroa reproduction, um, but you are, you're gonna break the brood cycle, which means that you're going to have a reduction in your population. So we just have to time it to make sure it's not gonna affect our crop or the food stores of our bees. So we have to look at when our main honey flow is and when we're going to need to bring in a lot of food and make sure that we're not going to be doing the big break right before that. I personally like to do a break coming up at the end of July because I have a little bit of a slowdown in my um, honey flow where I am in Michigan. And so that gives me a time where I can actually drop down um, the brood a little bit and give a break then. So here's a picture of a queen in a cage. There's a variety of cages that you can use, including ones where the queen is caged, but the workers can come in and out, um, which increases her pheromone. You wanna keep her caged for at least 12 days because that's how long the workers are capped. Or another option is you remove the queen and then you can replace with a cell or the colony will requeen itself. And that's another break in the brood cycle. So again, you wanna time it with your honey flow. Um, the other nice thing about this is I'm gonna talk about oxalic specifically later, but oxalic works best when you've got a break in the brood cycle. So you can combine these things too. So again, I'm gonna give you like a suite of tools, but it, it doesn't mean that you have to like join the break in the brood cycle team. You can just use them in combination.
there's so I talked about kind of making splits involving breaking the brood cycle. You can also do splits where you don't break the brood cycle and you could just introduce a mated queen to both. Um, it's not as effective as doing a split where using a queen cell or allowing them to raise a queen, but it is effective in that it works kind of like dilution in that we're really interested in the ratio of mites to bees, right? We're looking at that percent that's infested. So when we have two colonies and we have two queens, we leave the numerator alone, the number of mites, but we can increase the number of bees faster. So even just doing splits, even if you're using mated queens, is also important for varroa control. So you don't lose any workers, so this is something you can do before the honey flow, but again, the mites can catch up really quickly because you're not actually getting rid of any mites or really stopping um, the reproduction for them. All right, so this is our season-long management. Basically, we have drone brood removal and we have breaks in the brood cycle. There's a question about um, drone brood removal in the questions that you do reduce the drone populations for mating, which is a really good point. So around my mating yards, I obviously don't do drone brood removal. I put drone frames in and then I just leave those and allow them to hatch out. And so that's on purpose. But if you're in a place where there's bees everywhere um, and you're not concerned about the mating, then it, it wouldn't be such a problem. All right, so now I'm going to go into other things that we can do during the season that keep Varroa populations low. Um, and so I'm going to go into the soft acid treatments, which is the HopGuard 2, a half dose of formic acid, and oxalic acid, which is the one that you can't use when honey is on. And as you'll know, these are all chemical treatments. However, I do want to make a really good point that all treatments are not created equal. So when I talked about those early mite treatments, those are straight up synthetic pesticides. They're neurotoxins. And the ones that I'm going to cover here are naturally derived chemicals. I use the term softer. Some people hate the term softer because they... Um, I mean, if you use formic acid, you can make an acid as strongly as you want. But really what happened is when we first developed these miticides, people started to realize that they didn't want these things in their hives and they wanted things that were naturally derived and that didn't build up in the wax and that were safer for us to use. And the industry really listened and they started to come out with these um, naturally derived treatments. And so I'm going to focus mainly on those and I'm going to talk about some of the other ones as well. So I'm not going to recommend anymore that people use fluvalinate and Kumafos. Um, those two, even though they're still registered, we see tons of resistance to those and we also see tons of it built up in the wax around the country. So um, those I'm not going to recommend. All right, so the first one that's covered under the soft acids is HopGuard 2. It is natural, it's a food grade product, meaning that you can use it when your honey supers are on. It does not mean you can eat it, don't try that, that's gross. It appears to have no negative effects or very small effects on normal hive activity. And it doesn't leave um, residues in the honey. And here's a picture of it in use. Um, again, with all of these, you wanna to apply to the package directions. You can see that it does have like a sticky mess on your, um, so you'll wanna wear gloves. I can also tell you that you don't want to leave it in your truck on a hot day. It will get really, really hard to work. It is safe to use during the honey flu. On the label, it says that you can use twice per season. What they don't specify is that it works best if those two times that you're using it are right after each other. Um, so they did try it. So the original HopGuard was pretty terrible. The HopGuard 2 is better. They tried to make it so it stayed in the colony for longer, meaning that it would be in there the whole time where you went through the entire brood cycle. And what we see happens is that it does stay in there for a while, um, but it, it works the best if you do one, and then once that treatment is over, is do a second one. It's not super strong. So this is not one that you want to use if you're in that danger zone where your mites are really high. And so that's one of the points that I want you guys to get out of this session is that you don't use everything the same. So just because it's a mite treatment doesn't mean that you can use it the same. So if you did nothing all year 
And then you say, oh, I'm going to use, I'm going to treat my bees. And then you just put in a strip of hop guard. That's likely not going to be enough. However, where I found that it works well, really well for me is dealing with nukes. Um, so a lot of the other stuff is going to be way too big when we've got little tiny colonies. And um, the hop guard is something that you can use on a really small colony. All right, so formic acid is another one that you can use in the summertime when honey supers are on. It is labeled organic. So if you're working on an organic farm or that's a concern for you, um, this is an option that you can use. Again, it's a food grade product, so you can use it when honey supers are on. It doesn't have huge effects on normal hive activity and it doesn't leave residuals in the honey. Um, I have the picture of an ant on here, not just because I wasn't just getting confused, um, but it is something that we find like when ants bite you, it's the thing that stings in ants. So it is something that is um, completely naturally derived. The main option that we have to use it is Mite Away Quick Strips. And then that same company, Nod Apiaries, also made um, Formic Pro, which is a similar version. They're applied the same way. I think I have a slide of that coming up. Um, you want to, of course, apply it according to package directions. You can do it during the honey flow. This one, you definitely need to make sure that you're paying attention to the label and applying it during the temperatures of 55 to 85, um, which is what it's currently labeled for. And the reason is that if you put it on too low in the cold temperatures, it's just not going to work at all. It's not going to release any. Um, if you put it on when it's too high, and it's, this is especially important in the first three days. Um, it is a seven-day treatment, but let's say you put it on and then six days later it gets up to 87, all your bees are not going to die. Um, but if you put it on and it's 90 that day, you can actually really damage your bees. And there is an on-label um, option that you only use a half treatment. So a half dose is one strip. So you can see the person applying these here and they're putting this kind of strip down. So you open the plastic, you take out this little wax strip and you put it on the hive in the brood nest. And the full treatment is two and then the single treatment is just one of those strips. And I know a lot of people who have a lot of success of doing the single strip version in the summer because it allows you to um, have a less chance that you'll damage your bees and but you can still kind of do something to manage the mites while you have honey supers are on. So this is the new option that they came out with, Formic Pro. Um, I just got some to try this this year, but I know some people who've had really, really good success with this. And again, this is also labeled to use while honey supers are on. It's Formic Acid. Um, it's basically the same as the Mite Awake Quick Strips in the terms of the main chemical that is used, but it um, releases at a different rate. And so one of the concerns, especially if you're at that high end of the temperatures, is that you um, get into the, the range where you can damage your brood or you can damage your queen. And this is designed to release the formic at a different rate. All right, I hear a lot of questions around powdered sugar. And now I just want to clarify. So we talk a lot about using powdered sugar as a way to monitor for mites. So this is the powdered sugar rule where you take a half cup of bees and you roll them and then you see how many mites fall off. That's not the same as using powdered sugar as a treatment. One of the things I like to point out when I'm asked about this is that powdered sugar is a chemical. And even though it's a food grade chemical, it is a chemical and when you're applying it to your hives, it does damage the bees. So if you get it directly on the brood, you can kill the brood. And so if you're going to be applying a chemical that can cause brood damage as a way to manage mites, I would wanna use one that's very effective. So everything that we're going to use does have, I mean, even just going in the hive, can cause stress to your bees. So everything does have a negative effect. So we wanna make sure that it is really, really effective. Um, Randy Oliver on his site, scientificbeekeeping.com, does a very nice examination of the effectiveness of powdered sugar. And basically, if you go in there all the time, 
and use powdered sugar, you can do enough dustings that you can keep varroa managed. However, it does come at the expense of a lot of stress. Um, I just threw this one in today. This is something that I have not yet tried. I've seen a little video on there. No one has given this um, to me for free yet, so I haven't tried it. I haven't heard amazing things of people who've tried it either, but if someone has reports on how the bee gym has worked out for them, that would be cool, and you can let me know. Another thing that I haven't tried extensively but I've looked into is using heat for Varroa. So there's a couple things that have been brought out um, about where you raise the colony temperature. Um, usually they recommend that it's up to about 42 degrees Celsius or like 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And the idea is that a bee can survive that temperature but the Varroa cannot. Um, the reason, again, I have not tried one of these mechanisms and there's a few out on the market. The main reason I haven't tried them is because I can't afford them. The second main reason though is that the brood is really, really sensitive to temperature fluctuations. And so I can't imagine a scenario where the Varroa are able to be killed in the brood nest, but the developing pupa are not damaged at all. So I know the adult bees can handle that temperature, but the um, brood are much more sensitive to that. All right, so those were our season long interventions. So during the season, in our management plan, we need something that's not gonna disrupt honey production. And if we're going to be applying something, it needs to be safe for human consumption. Hopefully, at this point, mite levels are not high in your colonies. So you're maintaining or you're trying to stave off that population explosion rather than um, trying to drop it down from a really high level. So I know a lot of people, for example, in my area who are going out and applying a single mite away quick strip um, basically this week. And so as long as those temperature works, that's a perfectly lovely thing that you could be doing. All right, so now I'm going to go to this other part of our Varroa growth curve. And so these are, there's a couple treatment options that we have. Um, and once we have that huge peak in population, if we're at the end of the season, really our only option is the chemical options. Um, like I mentioned before, like for example, let's say it's September and you do your sugar roll and you've got 10 mites per 100 bees in there. You're not going to be able to do drone brood removal. If you do a break in the brood cycle, it's already too late. You've already got a lot of varroa in there. Um, you probably are seeing signs of viral disease. And so we really just have to focus on dropping that population down, both for the sake of our bees, but also for the sake of our neighbor's bees. So I'm going to talk about formic acid, thyme oils, and apivar um, that we can use in this case. So again, we're talking about this peak, and this is the, oh no, I monitored and it's September or October, or it also works for the, oh no, I'm a brand new beekeeper, I'm terrified of monitoring, but I keep losing bees every year and I have to do something um, because I know this is a high risk area. All right, so when monitoring shows that varroa populations have already reached dangerous levels, we need to quickly bring them down to prevent colony damage or death. And again, if you've lost bees every year for varroa, you've had high levels every year, then you already know your mite populations will be high in the fall. So you don't actually have to wait until they're dangerous levels. And a lot of people, um, we want to make sure that we're not putting extra stuff in our hives. And so a lot of people get really worried about prophylactic treatment. So for example, um, with American fall brood, it is still out there in the world. There is a chance that you will get American fall brood. Um, I'm in hundreds of colonies every year, and I've seen it a, less than a dozen times, a half dozen times in my life. Um, so it's really, really rare. So if you were treating with antibiotics twice a year, that's true prophylactic treatment. That's definitely extra chemical use. However, if you lose your bees every single year, then, you know, like I said, we're in peak epidemic for Varroa right now. So it's not a dramatic move to be counting on the fact that every single fall, my Varroa populations peak, and you don't necessarily want to wait until it's really, really bad in order to, to um, keep them down. What I see a lot is that um, beekeepers in some of these high risk areas 
are waiting until the disease is so bad that you almost can't bring the bees back to health in times for winter. All right, so out of these tools that we have as an intervention, we need to pay attention to how early it is in the season. So how much time do we have for the bees to raise their winter brood? Are there honey supers on? Or will I expect them to be on before the treatment is complete? And how many times you can come back to visit the colony? Basically, this is because some of these or most of these you can't use while the honey supers are on. And then also, um, they do take weeks to work. And so you have to make sure that if it's really, really high and you have four weeks left till, you know, the winter brood is raised, then you've got some time. But if it's really, really high and it's pretty late in the season, then you really want to do something that's going to drop it quickly. So again, formic acid is one of our tools that we can use um, at the time that it's a peak. You notice in this picture, the beekeeper is putting on two strips. So that's the full dose of formic. You're going to apply it, and that's according to package directions. And again, you can still have honey supers are on. Um, the same temperature range applies for this, but we want to be even more careful about that upper end of it. And this is something, the nice thing about this treatment is that it's only seven days for it to work. So let's say um, it's getting really late in the season and you already tried thymol and you still have high levels of bees or you had them under control, but then a bunch of bees came in from somewhere else with a lot of varroa and you're at the last minute, then you want to put something in um, like this that's going to work really, really quickly and knock it down. Um, there's a couple that are thymol based. And again, these are naturally derived. It's from the thyme plant. Um, you can't just plant a bunch of thyme plants around your hives. Well, I mean, you can. They're really pretty and the bees like the flowers, but it's not going to do anything for the mites because it is really a concentration of that oils. Um, I really, really strongly recommend that you only use the prepackaged options. Um, a lot of people think that because it's labeled that it's less natural than if they put in essential oils that are just in plain old essential oil kits. There's a couple reasons that it's really important to use um, the labeled ones. The first reason is that because it's legal that way. And the second reason though is that these have been tested to make sure they're safe for bees. A lot of essential oils are not well regulated, but also you don't know what the dose is. And the big thing about the actual pre-made treatments is that they um, have, they're in a little delivery vehicle that allows them to give a dose over time. And when we're dealing with mites, we're dealing with like a little bug on a big bug. And so that little treatment window is, is not enormous. And so we have to find something that is going to be effective against the mites while it's not going to hurt our bees. The third thing is that oils build up in your wax. And you really want to be careful when you're putting any oils in your, hop, in your colony because those smells, so first off, for health reasons, they may not be good for human consumption. They can taint your honey, but also those smells can really affect the communication of the bees in your hive. All right, so while I say that essential oils have a lot of um, use in treating bees, we really want to make sure that we're doing ones that we know are tested and are effective. So we want to use them according to package directions. These are not to be used when the supers are on. And that is because they build up in the wax and um, they have things that will taint the smell of the honey and they're just not designed to be food grade. So this is something that you're going to do after you remove the honey supers. But you do want to make sure that you're doing this before the winter bees are made. So these are, there's two treatments. They are both effective against mites, but they take a long time to work. And so a lot of places people will wait until after goldenrod honey, like in my area mid-September, and they'll take the honey supers off and then they'll put a mite treatment on and then they'll think that they're covered for winter. And what happens is that by the time they get that mite treatment on, it is way too little too late and we've already gotten through that peak and we've already got high levels in the mites. Um, so here's one of the options. It's Apolife Var, and it's applied with these little wafer things. So these little four cookies, um, you break them off and you separate them through the hive, and then you have to come back and do another application of them. 
And this is the other one is Apigard, which is basically like a gel. And you just open up this little foil thing and then the bees crawl all over it and carry it through the hive. Um, commercially, you can get it in much bigger options as well. And then um, the third one, which I don't have a picture for, is Apivar. And that is a synthetic chemical, but it is the one that is still effective. And it does work quickly. So you're at the point that it's late in the season, your bees are sick, um, Apivar is an option. All right, so I'm gonna talk about choosing your tools. Um, and I have another flow chart of this as well. And again, this will be written down. But if you've got new packages or small hives, you do need something that's gentle. So using the oxalic acid drench, which I'm gonna go into detail for the next couple slides, is very useful. Um, and HopGuard 2 is also a gentle option that we can use. During the honey flow, our main concerns is that it has to be food grade. We don't want to do anything that's going to taint the honey, and that's HopGuard 2. Um, I put the half max because a lot of times you also don't want to be incredibly disruptive during that time as well um, because we want our bees to go out and keep making honey and not have queen issues. And then when we get to the end of the season, if we need a serious knockback because we have seen high mites or we expect to have high mites, then we've got our thymol options, the Apolive Far, the Apigard, or we have the full Mite Away Quick Strips, which is the two strips, and then we also have Apivar as our synthetic option. Um, there is a really good question about the repeated use of the same treatment. So let's say you do the half of the Mite Away Quick Strips during the summer, and then you wanna do a second one um, over like as the fall knockback. And that's a good question. And like I said, we are very concerned about resistance. And because we wanna make sure that we have these things available to us as long as we need them. Hopefully we don't need them for much longer because we figure this whole Varroa thing out, but we don't wanna lose them because our bees become, or because the mites become resistant. With the acids, it's a little less likely that we see resistance um, than we do with the synthetic chemicals. The reasoning before that is that um, the ones that act as toxins, the way that resistance happens is that the mites really just need to use, um, they need to change maybe like one or two little pathways um, and then they're able to not, they're able to clear the toxin without being affected by it. So it's not a very serious mo mutation and it's something that's much um, more probable or sometimes likely for insects or mites to do. However, with the acids, we think that the way, so we don't know exactly how the acids work on the mites, but it seems to be affecting their cuticle. So anytime that you make a mutation in order to um, develop resistance to something, there's always a benefit. And then of course, there's always a cost. And so if you're trying, so we think that the acids work by actually disrupting like the shell of the mites or um, on their feet or something to do with actually just physically damaging their body. And then um, if that's the case, the mites, it's really hard for them to cause enough mutations that it would allow them to be resistant to those acids, but not force them to become so dramatically altered that they are really, really lose a lot of fitness. So it is, so that's my long answer. My short answer is that, yes, technically we wanna be rotating things because that's what integrated pest management is about and that's how we retain things. However, with the acids, um, especially like the formic acid, it's very, very unlikely that we would start to see resistance to that. All right, so now on to oxalic acid. So this is not just a random um, flower, this is oxalis. And oxalic acid is found often in foods. It's what's in spinach that makes your mouth dry. It's in rhubarb. Um, so it's a common naturally derived acid. There's a couple ways that you can use it. So one is the drench, which is shown here. And the other is people call it vaporization. It's technically a sublimation um, where you take the chemical and you heat it up and you either blow it in the hive or you allow it to dissipate throughout the hive and basically coat the bees. Um, the idea with oxalic acid is that you want to get it on all of the bees. Um, and so it works really well. It doesn't get through the cappings. 
um, so that you want it, so you want to use it at a time when you don't have a lot of um, capped pupa. So this is during brood breaks, which we do have quite a couple natu or times naturally. So one is when we have a caged queen or when we're doing a split. The other is in the winter and you can do the vaporization at this point or right when you're introducing packages. So this is a lovely tool when you're introducing packages. Um, I usually view it as a treat up. One of the things that we saw this year, which I did not see, um, or which I saw basically all over the country talking to people and talking to different state apiarists is that some people just started to use oxalic and they still, the mites still got ahead of them. And so it's, it is a treatment that will knock off the mites from the um, bees, but it's not going to get everything out of the hive. And so you do want to be careful. So one of the pros about it is that it's very cheap, um, which is nice. It also seems to have, it seems to be on the softer side of things. So I did mention that for the mites, but also in the effects of broods and bees. We definitely don't know the effect on the bees entirely. I've spent some time um, looking up to that or looking into that, and I haven't found anything definitive. One of the big concerns is actually the effect on the queen. Um, so some people like to do the vaporization over and over and over again throughout the summer. And for the worker bees, you know, they're not going to be affected and they're going to be die or they're going to die um, by winter. But if you're doing it many times, we don't know the effect if a queen gets hit by it, you know, six times or 10 times. So there is some stress. Again, it doesn't kill the mites under the cappings. It's not registered for use with honey supers on. Um, so a lot of people want to know about why, because it is a naturally derived acid and the other acids are naturally derived acids. Um, and we do know you have to eat a lot of oxalic in order for you um, to get sick from it. However, one of the big issues is that if we're applying it in this method, it is considered a pesticide application. And one of the companies went through the trouble and all of the funding and all of the testing to get it approved as a pesticide and to get it labeled as such. And then nobody actually rewards that and purchases their product. They just buy it off of Amazon or at the hardware store for cheaper. And so there's no financial incentive for people to do the FDA testing. So basically it is not a tested product and it is not labeled for use. Um, for me, I'm not using it during the summer anyway, because it's a lot of labor and I don't think it's worth it and I have legal options. And so I haven't found that it was necessary. Well, I mean, it isn't necessary, but there's other things that I can do as well. So where I like to use it is I'll use this drench um, just in the method applied that's shown here and I'll use it on nukes. And I've also used it on, um, after I've made splits where I've used queen cells. And the way that I've done it is that I've split a colony and I've left the mated queen, the one that was originally there, in a hive without any capped brood and she gets the oxalic um, drench right away. And then all the capped brood gets a queen cell and when that queen comes back, um, you can do the oxalic treatment on them and you'll have a break in the brood cycle as well for that. So a lot of people ask whether or not you can just do this three times in a row, a week apart. Um, there are a lot of people who do that. Again, you wanna just be concerned about how often you're doing that for your queen. Um, like I said, we don't know the effects. It is more variable than a lot of them. And um, you don't wanna be doing this at a period where you have the honey supers on. The temperature range for the drench, it's not as important in terms of the usage of it. Um, it's important in that you want to get all of the bees covered. So you want to do this at a time when the bees are in a loose cluster. So there's some really good times for that. When I do it in conjunction um, with the splits in the summer, I go in in the early morning um, period. So I go in when it's like in a loose cluster. It also works really nicely to um, do this, like I said, like after all your winter bees are formed, 
in October as a cleanup and you can go in when it's like 60 degrees and then all of the bees are inside. If you go in and do it on a really nice day, then you're going to miss a lot of the foragers. And when you do it and it's too cold, you're going to be doing a lot of stress to your bees. Um, similarly with the vaporizer or any of those other options, you want to kind of be in the same um, time constraints or temperature constraints in that you want to catch the bees in the cluster. Um, I do want to say with the drench, I followed the instructions on scientificbeekeeping.com to make it up to the 2.5% um, solution. So that's what I use. You do want to use distilled water when you're doing that. So the oxalic acid doesn't react with other things in the water. And you do have to use it the day that you make it up or basically pretty similar um, quickly after you make it up. So here's one of the sublimation tools. Um, some people really like this. I have one. I've tried it a little bit. For me, it doesn't work that well because I found that um, the drench was just much more fast for me. Um, they do have similar efficacy, applying vi via the drench or via the, this little sublimator tool. Um, the drench obviously if you do it in winter time can be much more stressful for the bees so this is a nice tool for that um, late season one like let's say you don't get in in october and you we don't have a nice warm winter or, or late fall um, then you can do this one of the things with the oxalic acid as a late treatment so this is like in the winter time treatment is you're not actually helping your bees survive that winter you're helping them survive the next winter which is a little confusing, but basically what I mean is that if I go out this October and my winter bees are already formed and I do an oxalic acid treatment, then what I'm doing is I'm not protecting my winter bees. Either those winter bees are already sick or they're not sick. If they're already sick, then this little oxalic acid treatment to knock down the phreatic mites is not going to be sufficient. But if my bees are already healthy, what this does, it means that in the spring, when they first start to raise brood, those adult mites that overwinter with the cluster are not, go you're not going to have a bunch of them overwintering with the cluster to like jump in those first few generations of brood and start affecting them right away. So let's say your population was kind of high and, but your bees were still okay. Like maybe you had um, a bunch come in really, really late after most of your bees were formed. Then what can happen is that when you start off in the spring, you're going to start off at a really high level. And then that means that you're going to reach that peak much earlier in the season because we have exponential growth, so it'll get quicker. So it's a good thing to do so that the next year you're setting yourself up well. All right, so a lot of people also have asked me about the oxalic acid on the shop towels. Um, this again is not yet licensed for use. I did get an exemption to do an experiment with this um, in conjunction with Randy Oliver and a couple other universities to look at it over the summer. It did cause some knockback in the mites. Um, it was on the very, very gentle end of things. Um, so it didn't work amazingly. Um, in speaking with Randy too, there's a lot that needs to be worked out with this in terms of figuring out the amount of towels to use, the amount of glycerin to use, the amount of oxalic to use. So it's not something that is ready for prime time yet. Um, it was very easy to apply. It's very cheap. However, I have got blue paper towels all over everything now because the bees propolize them down, which for me is kind of a pain um, to deal with. And so um, I'm looking forward to seeing how this and there's other versions of doing oxalic and how those get worked out. But right now it, it wouldn't be worth it for me to recommend um, that you do this. All right, so those are kind of all of those, um, all of our options that I know of right now. If you know of others, feel free to tell me about them. And what we want to do is we want to figure out what our management strategy is. So we don't want to get to the point where all of a sudden our bees are really sick or they're dead. We want to kind of be planning because we know how varroa biology works. So there's things to take into consideration when we're making our plans. What time of year it is? Are you comfortable making splits? Is the colony broodless? Is it big and strong? Do you have honey supers on? Is the population of mites really high or are we being preventative right now? 
So I'm going to go over all of our options again. Don't worry about catching it all now. Um, I'm going to have this printed out. All right, so starting with some things that can help us make our decision. If it's early in the season and you're really good with hive manipulations and you understand bee biology, you've got a couple options that allow you to keep the mites low. Um, so we can do drone brood removal, we can do splits, and we can do breaks in the brood cycle. And like I said, there are people who do just this and they're able to keep the mites under control. And so um, I do a lot of my mite management just by making lots of splits and it keeps the mites, it, it works very, very well. So that if you have that option and you're comfortable doing splits, then that is something that you can do. But let's say you're a total beginner beekeeper or you're coming upon this late in the season when mites are already high, then you've got to go another route. So if the colony is broodless, then oxalic acid is awesome. So again, this is like when we get a package or um, in conjunction with the splits or also um, at the end of the season. If not, if the colony is big and strong, if it's, if it's a little tiny nuke, then hop guards are option. Um, so that's a nice one that we can use if the colony is pretty small so that we're not using something that's much too dramatic for it. If it is a big strong colony then we have lots of um, options. A big thing is whether or not honey supers are on. We don't want to be selling tainted honey um, even if it's a natural thing we don't want it in the honey. So if there are no honey supers on, we have lots of options. We have Amitraz, we have the Mite Away Quick Strips, which is formic acid. We have Formic Pro, which is formic acid. We have the Apigard and the Apolife Var, which are both our thymol options. If we do have honey supers on, it limits us a little bit. Um, and we also need to make sure that rural populations, whether which um, version we're in. So we kind of treat when honey supers are on differently depending if we're on maintenance or if we're on intervention. Um, so if we're in intervention or if we're in maintenance mode, we can use the half drip, the half dose of the mite away quick strips, the formic acid, or we can use the formic pro. So that's basically like this time of year, or we can use hop guard too. And remember that that works best when you're using one followed by the other. Um, if the rural populations are already high, then we do need that knockdown. And if the honey supers are on, then our options are really the formic acid versions. All right. So you've got, um, just to review, we've got these season long management things that we're gonna be doing to keep rural populations low. And it is really success if our bees are never sick. Um, so it's not success whether or not we treated or we didn't treat or um, however you wanna talk about that. What is really success if our bees never got sick from rural associated viruses. So even in the point where we're not seeing high levels of mite, there's things we can do to make sure we don't get to that point, which include drone brood removal, breaking the brood cycle, um, these soft acid treatments, which would be our hop guard to our half dose of formic, and the oxalic acid, which not when honey's on. At the end of the season management, um, which is like if we get these rural populations that take off or if they've taken off on us every single year, then really we have to use chemical treatments to knock them back, which is the formic acids, the thymols, thyme oils, and then apivar. And then we've got this lovely extra tool of the oxalic acid in the broodless periods, um, which I think really excels during packages and for winter. All right, things that do not work. So I've told you a couple things that work, a couple things that I haven't tried. I have tried this wishing that you don't have to deal with Varroa. Um, it does get really, really overwhelming. Um, I get a lot of people who hear all this and just hate it. And I also hate dealing with Varroa. I have tried wishing that I don't have to deal with it in my hives and then you end up with dead hives. So don't do that. Um, denial and neglect. There is a very big difference of treatment free, which is a lot of work, and treatment free being I'm just leaving my bees alone and I'm not gonna deal with that. Um, because you're all listening to this, it means that at least you're 
trying to manage it and you're not going to neglect your bees, but we want to make sure that we're actively taking care of our animals and we're making sure that our animals are in good health. And again, it just stay away from the illegal or untested oils. Um, I just don't like to put stuff in my hives unless, like, if I'm going to go through the trouble of putting a chemical in my hive, I want to make sure that it's actually been rigorously tested to make sure it's not going to harm my bees or not interfere with stuff. All right, so general principles for a mite management plan. Successful management is about the bite population levels and the health of your bees. It's not the number of treatments that you applied. So um, keep this in mind. I have a lot of beekeepers who call me and they lost their colonies and they say, well, I treated for mites, so it wasn't mites. And if you have um, a gajillion mites in your hive and you apply a treatment that maybe gets 80% of them, 20% of a gajillion is still a lot of mites in there. I know I've done the math. And so you're still, your bees could still be at risk just because you've treated. Um, I've definitely seen colonies where we went through and we applied a treatment, we monitored again, the mites were still really high and we had to apply a second treatment. And hopefully in most cases that's enough. And so it's not whether or not you treated, it's whether or not your mite populations are low. You want to monitor, and this is both to make sure you're at the safe level, but also to make sure that your methods are working. Um, again, you could put something in or you could um, apply something to your hive and you could still be at really high levels. And so you want to make sure that um, you test before and you test after you do things. And this is where that sticky board could be useful, um, but doing the alcohol wash before and after is really important. Be prepared to change or modify your strategy. Um, what is going to happen is that your environmental risk is going to change over the course of the year and from year to year. So really, the amount of risk your bees have really depends on what's in the environment. In some years, you may have a lot of bees that are growing a lot of varroa in your flight zone, and some years you may not. And it is really going to be highly variable. And so um, I've met someone who really th felt that they had Varroa beat and they had this great strategy, but they weren't monitoring because they tried it once and it worked really well for them one year. And what you want to do is make sure that you don't get caught in that because next year you could have a totally different degree of risk, meaning that you know, you used maybe a set of soft treatments or you treat it on this schedule, and then next year you have different weather, you have different um, varroa dynamics, and you have different environmental risks. So just be prepared um, to be really reactive of what's actually going on in your colony, not so much what you did on a calendar. And what works for somebody else may not work for you. Um, there are definitely people who, can, who live in areas where there's very, very low risk. And if you live in an area where there are low viruses and no varroa, then you are in a very low risk area and you, may don't, you maybe don't have to do that much work. It might be that you make a split in the spring and you, or you split really heavy in the spring and your bees build up slowly and winter comes early enough that you just don't have to worry about it that much. Or you maybe live in an area where you don't have a winter and you're just constantly battling it and you've got tons of bees around and you've got um, a really, really high risk area and you're going to have to do a lot of work. And so one of the things that I really don't like about the way we talk about it is that a lot of people talk about success as in the fewer number of treatments that they put in their hive. And in my mind, success is healthy bees. And so if you're in a high risk area, it may be more work for you. And that is just the sad reality of keeping bees in the area where you are. Another thing is to think way ahead and be proactive. So um, a lot of these different treatments work over weeks. And a, one of the biggest mistakes that beekeepers make is that they think about treating as something you do before winter as a way um, to get your hive through winter, like on the same terms as they think about wrapping your hive or thinking about, you know, putting feed in the hive for winter, making a candy board. You want to make sure that your winter bees are safe, which means you want to make sure that Varroa is under control before they're developed. So a lot of people kind of think of Varroa as this thing that you need to manage, you know, before you're putting the bees to bed before winter, but let's say, so in my area, 
we're going to be making our winter bees in August and September. And if I'm going to use a three week treatment, I need to make sure that it's clean by that period. So I'm really talking about paying close attention in beginning of August for this, um, for my wintertime bees. So um, again, part of your risk you can see on mitecheck.com where we try to map different areas of where there's um, high levels of mites. You can also help us by collecting data and reporting it there. Um, so that we can see how mite levels go throughout each year. And just remember that your bees do deserve to be healthy and free of parasites. And I'm going to leave this up um, for a little bit, and then I'll take some questions, and then I'll go through uh, a couple examples as well. Um, so there's a question about a threshold for a soft treatment. And um, so... I, just to go back to the threshold bit, so if you're at a point right now and you see low levels of mites, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do anything. It also doesn't necessarily mean you're safe. So unfortunate for us, the thresholds are not super clear like they are for a lot of things because what we often see is that because it's that exponential growth, you go really, really fast. Um, into the danger area. And so sometimes by the time you're above threshold, it's really too late for your bees. What I typically see in Michigan is at this time of year, I'm at like one or two mites per sample, so per 300 bees. And I'll maybe stay this way through July. And then it's like mid-August, it all of a sudden takes off. So if I've got colonies that I've been monitoring now for a few years and I know it's going to take off in mid-August, I don't necessarily have to wait until I see that level in June. So if I know that I was at one or two mites in June, one or two mites in July, and then I'm going to be at, you know, 12 mites mid-August, I can still do the half max. And so for me in a lot of, um, so my queen yards, I don't treat unless I have to, um, which is a different conversation. But in my honey production yards or my drone yards, who are raising a lot of drones, they are all getting the half mite away quick strips right now. All right, I'm going to go through a couple questions or a couple examples then. All right, so let's say we have a brand new hive. We're brand new beekeeper and we're moving into an area that is really densely populated with tons of beekeepers um, who maybe aren't managing mites well. So we've got really heavy disease pressure. So um, one of the, so here's just an example of what you could do as a new beekeeper. So let's say you get a package. Your first option in April is you could apply the oxalic acid by drench a week after the queen is released. So you go in there, you see that she's been um, released, and you uh, check, she's laying eggs, lovely, and you can go and do an oxalic acid dribble. And basically what you're doing is making that colony start at much lower. In May, we monitor, and in June, we put in our hop guard too. And that's because we're assuming, um, like I talked in the Varroa Dynamics video, that there's mites coming in throughout the whole season. So the HopGuard 2 is our option that we can use with honey supers on, and that's a little less. And then in July, we're monitoring, in August, we're monitoring, and we're going to apply Apigard Life or Apivar after our honey's off. And in September, we continue to monitor, and let's say we are still really high, then we've got the mite away quick strips, and then in October we can use oxalic acid. That's a lot. Um, but again, this is a place with, this, with high disease pressure. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of stuff in your hive. But if that is what is necessary, um, that's a perfectly reasonable um, strategy. Okay, let's say we have light disease pressure though, and it's a brand new package. We could do the same thing where we apply an oxalic acid by drench a week after the queen is released. So we start off the same, we monitor, and if we ever get high above threshold, then we have the mite away quick strips. So again, these are the, the same thing where we'd have a beekeeper and they start off really, really 
um, they start off exactly the same, but depending what's going on in their area, you could have someone who has to do a lot to keep parasites under control. You could have to do someone who basically does nothing to keep parasites under control. Um, again, it's also going to depend on what your colony does. A lot of packages supersede. That's a lovely break in the brood cycle. Um, a lot of beginner beekeepers don't put supers on in time and the hive gets honey bound. That's another break in the brood cycle. I mean, sometimes there's even stuff like you get chalk brood and that's a break in the brood cycle. That's not, the, that's not a recommended treatment, by the way. Um, but there's a lot of other things that make it so that you don't have to manage for varroa. All right, a third example. So this is an overwintered hive. So this is different from a package because they are going to start raising brood much, much earlier. Um, and it's going to be, they're going to, start, they're more at risk. Um, so let's say it's May. I'm going to perform some splits. I'm going to monitor. In June, I'm doing the half mite away quick strips. In July, I'm going to monitor and I'm just going to go ahead and put Apigard on at the end of the month when I pull off my honey. In August, I just have the mite away quick strips if I'm above threshold. You'll see that that one's there a lot. And the reason it's there a lot is because um, that you can, um, it works very quickly. So let's say it's September and I notice that I'm really, really high. So apparently like a, um, a yard crashed around me and I'm really high, then I want to be able to bring it down quickly. All right, example four, I've got an overwintered hive, but I'm in an area with really light disease pressure. I perform my splits, maybe I do some drone brood removal, and then I just kind of watch them, and that may be totally fine, and then I do some oxalic acid in the winter time. Um, another example of a management strategy, I've got an overwintered hive, I've got light disease pressure, but I'm, in, I'm an experienced beekeeper. And so in the springtime, I know that I'm not going to peak because in varroa populations because I haven't the whole time. And so I'm going to just, in July, I'm going to create a split with cells. Um, and I'm going to do the thing where I apply oxalic acid via drench. And then in August, I just monitor. And so if it gets above threshold, I'll use the max. But if it doesn't, I don't do anything. And then in October, I can do oxalic acid. So that might be just splits, or it might be just splits in oxalic acid, or it might be splits, oxalic acid, and mite away quick strips, depending on the year. All right, so your bees deserve to be healthy and free of pests. This is gonna be the year, you guys. We're gonna have varroa under control, no losses. And we're gonna do it by effectively monitoring mite populations. We can use splits, drone brood removal, and other management strategies to keep, keep them low, throughout the season, and we've got products on hand to intervene if they have high levels of mites. And the most important thing is to make sure that your winter bees are raised in the best conditions and they're not getting heavily damaged by mites. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this. Um, like I said, there'll be other handouts on our website, keepbeesalive.org. Um, there's a mailing list on there so you can um, be in touch if there's other upcoming webinars and more resources. Thank you.